All right, uh, another, another great uh, speaker we have today. Uh, <laughs> uh, as always, please make sure your uh, cell phones are turned off or on vibrate uh, because that's, we just don't want any interruptions. Uh, as, as you know, Jim Wood's speaker series was uh, put together for the purpose of bringing leaders uh, from different walks of life to talk to our students staff and faculty about various things that, uh, what it takes to be a leader. And uh, also to talk to us about all of us, there is potential in all of us to be leaders in whatever we do. So uh, today I'm, I'm so excited to have uh, Mr. Tom Johnson. If you have not picked one of these up, uh, please, do in the business school we have several of these things that features all of the leadership and and of course Mr. Johnson is featured there. Let me just read about this gentleman uh, and his uh, his experiences because we are truly lucky to have him here. Mr. Wyatt Thomas Johnson or Mr. Tom Johnson is a former CEO of CNN. Uh, he has had a 45 year career he served uh, as a White House assistant to President Lyndon Johnson, CEO of Dallas Times Herald, Los Angeles Times, and CNN. Um, he, he is our neighbor to the south. He grew up in Macon, Georgia, got a financial aid scholarship from a publisher there to attend uh, University of Georgia and received his undergraduate degree in journalism. From there, he uh, went to Harvard Business School and received his MBA from Harvard Business School. After that, um, he joined as a White House Fellow in 1965 and was assigned to President uh, Press Secretary at that time, Bill, Mr. Bill Moyers. The White House Fellowship led him to several positions in the White House, and including uh, being the Executive Assistant to President Johnson in Austin, Texas. In 1990, Mr. Tom Johnson became president of CNN, the day before Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait. So you have to understand that he, he led CNN to what it is today at, the, at that critical turning point. Um, he, today, he devotes uh, much of his life helping people who suffer from depression an illness Mr. Johnson has battled for more than 20 years. He serves as the chairman of the board of Lyndon B. Johnson Foundation. Mr. Johnson, his wife Edwina, have been married for 44 years, have two children and two grandchildren. Please help me welcome Mr. Tom Johnson. Thank you very much. I, I want to thank especially uh, Dr. Tidwell for his uh, persistence uh, in, uh, in uh, inviting me here and then absolutely not uh, taking no for an answer. Uh, but I should also say the reason that I am here is also sitting in the room, and that's Frank Argenbright, my very good friend who spoke with you. When, Frank? Six months ago, eight months ago. Uh, there is nobody that I have met along my life's way that inspires me as much as uh, Frank Arkenbright. Uh, he, as you probably know, uh, has chaired our own several companies. But if there is one person that I've met that sort of personifies the expression that he could sell uh, ice to Eskimos, it's Frank Arkenbright. He is a person who can market, sell, and inspire people. And I'm sure that uh, all of you know that from the time that he, he, he spent here uh, with you. He told me also just how much he enjoyed this class. Now, are there others in the room that don't have your crib notes from this morning that I brought along with me because I have more copies? Uh, you don't need to take notes. Uh, if anybody does not have them, we'll get them to you. Raise your hands. There are just a few. Keep your hands up and we'll get them to those who don't, don't have them. Okay. A few years ago, the graduating class at uh, Duke School of Business, the Fuqua School of Business, named for uh, J.B. Fuqua here in Atlanta, uh, asked me 
something that I'd never been asked before. They, they said, would you, in your commencement address here, describe for us the lessons of your own life uh, that could apply to us who are graduating uh, this year with our MBAs? I took a lot of time to, uh, to think about that. Um, and what you have before you are not necessarily lessons that you should apply to your life, but they are lessons that I have learned along the way. Some of them I learned because I made mistakes. Some of them I learned because I saw them in something that I read in an article in a, uh, some type of publication. And a few are, I think, entirely original with me. An example of one that is entirely original with, with me is the one that says, do not marry the wrong spouse. <laughs> it is difficult enough living with the right one. And I've been living with the right one for now, actually, uh, 40, 46 years. No decision that you make in life is more important, I think, than, uh, than that decision. And the next most important decision I say to everybody is whether you decide to have children uh, on your own. In fact, it may very well be that uh, the decision to have children or not is the most important decision uh, of your life. But in any case, I've updated these completely. There's a lot of new material in these that either I didn't uh, think about before uh, or uh, I just th felt like uh, needed, needed to, be, to be at it. I decided that this morning, uh, trying to think about sitting where you're sitting, and it wasn't that long ago, it seems, that I was sitting in classrooms just like this, uh, that I tried to say, okay, what can I share with you uh, out of my life that uh, may be helpful to you in your life? I will summarize. Work hard, do right. If you were to condense everything I have learned, work hard and do right. Um, I grew up in Macon. Uh, I grew up outside of Macon, actually uh, closer to Lizella than to, uh, to Macon. My dad had a third grade education. My mother, uh, who married him at age 16 uh, was not given the opportunity to go to college because her father at that point didn't think that uh, women uh, needed a college education. And I should tell you, I am really very, very uh, pleased to look out at the diversity of everybody here. But in any case, my dad was an odd jobs man. Uh, and he brought home virtually no income. Uh, my mother worked six days a week in a small grocery store as a clerk. But at some point, I guess maybe around the eighth or the ninth grade, I had tried sacking groceries in a, a small uh, grocery store. I had tried pumping gas uh, in, a, in a small filling station. But I really just concluded that I really wanted to make something of myself in life. I can't explain exactly why other than I considered my own father not to be a responsible person. I saw the example of my mother who worked, I'm serious, every single day, including many Sundays in order for us to, uh, to have uh, uh, just minimal uh, life. Uh, I'm an only child, and so I think it probably was really uh, rather uh, interesting for me. Uh, but I suspect that many of you have fathers who've been terrific examples and some who have not been terrific examples. Uh, some of you have mothers who have enabled you to get as far as you are today uh, through love and through encouragement, but I just within me became this determination that I was going to make something of myself. I hope that 
either within your family, your work experiences, your school, that each of you will decide to make something of yourself. Each of you has the potential to make it. In a way, I think I somewhat share your experience. I also grew up south of I-20. I also grew up not with the wealthy, the country club set, the rich. I was very lucky that I was born white. I was very lucky in many ways that I was born male because in my era, it was a decisive advantage. The public schools I attended were segregated not just by race, but by sex. We had all white boys school and all white girls school and our then uh, black schools were sep separated. And this year, one of the proudest things that I feel I've done in my life is 50 years after the graduation of uh, our classes, which incidentally at, at Ballard Hudson in Macon included Otis Redding, I pulled together 50 years later the graduates of all four of those schools. And for many of us, it was the first time we'd ever met. And I thought about how many friendships we could have developed in life if we had uh, gone together to schools uh, at the time. The key to it all, I don't think, is, uh, and it's, a, it's almost difficult to convey it in a way, but I think the difficulty is not necessarily your grade point average and not necessarily your uh, intelligence test, it's your resolve. I mean, I think that each of you can decide just how far you wish to go. In this era of unemployment, layoffs, cutbacks, I know it's tough, but I also want you to know that most businesses really very much would like to have those who will work hard and do right. They are looking for the conscientious person who is willing to give their very best. And as you see at the very top of this, number one, I say, do your personal best at all you can undertake. Nobody can ask for more. That means your personal best. It doesn't mean my personal best. Some of you can leap this high. Some of you can leap this high. You know your personal best. Some of you can, 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 can accomplish many other things in life better than the other. But it provided you've given it your best, nobody can ask for more. Work hard, number two. It does pay off. I can assure you in any profession, any profession, from the bottom to the top, if you work hard, it will pay off. You will get out of your life an amount roughly equal to what you put into it. Laziness does not work. Do right, by that I mean that integrity is very badly needed. When in doubt about doing the right thing, just ask yourself this question. How will my actions, taken in private, look when they're disclosed to my mother, my father, to my friends? It is the best, simplest test because so much of what we do in life, we do behind closed doors. We do in the privacy of our work office. We do it, whatever. But just ask yourself, how will my actions look? when they're published on the front page of uh, the paper in Clayton County or the, A the AJC or whether your mom and dad. And it's like, I don't want to sound like a preacher uh, because I am not. My life has been full of as many mistakes as anybody that you know. I, I will tell you about my failures. But a few other just key points to go down. Number four, praise works. Criticism doesn't. Praise works. Criticism doesn't. 
praise good work. Don't focus so much on criticizing. Humility and selflessness work. Arrogance and selfishness do not work. Giving credit to others works. Taking credit for others' work does not work. Working together as a team, being a lone, one-person band does not work, except in some fields. Fields such as artists and writers and scientists and singers, musicians. I mean, clearly there are many forms of work where individual uh, almost separateness does pay off. But in most cases, it's how well do you work with others in most cases. Openness works. Closed minds and closed meetings do not work. Trust works, trusting each other, trusting as much as you can. Distrust generally over time does not. Truth works, just telling it like it is usually is the absolute best policy. Lying does not work. Humor works. I think we all find humor a wonderful, wonderful Experience, good therapy, but silliness never works. Excellence works. Doing your best may be a better way to say it. Mediocrity never works for long. Treat others the way you want to be treated. If I could summarize every human relations book I've read in my lifetime, I would condense it down to this number 14. Treat other people the way you wish to be treated. Being mean or tough or a czar does not work. Listen more. You never learn while you're talking. And thank you for your, your listening this morning. Don't try to build yourself up by cutting somebody else down. Why waste the time on cutting somebody else down? Just focus on yourself. Expect failures and defeats in life. But remember... Life is 99 rounds. You can get knocked down. You can get knocked out at different stages along the way. But get yourself back up off the mat and go on because you can, you can do it. Do not define your self-worth solely by a job. You are so much more than the work that you hold. And yet so many of us let that job define us. A job can be taken away. If you have defined yourself solely by your job, what do you have left when it's taken away? I was absolutely devastated when I was removed as publisher of the Los Angeles Times in something of a conservative family coup over the two of us who would be, were considered much more of the liberal leaders of that uh, newspaper at the time. Now, what I said earlier about, you know, do your best may sound inconsistent with number 19. Do not become a workaholic. Please do not become a workaholic. I was a workaholic. It's like keeping the pedal to the metal all the time. And you can burn out. I did in my mid-40s. But you need to all to develop hobbies outside of your career. And I think the younger at your age, the better. Hobbies that, uh, that, that are fun for you and can balance out the work that you do. Um, take time for your family and take time for your friends. At the end of life's way, when you get to be an old man like me, your family and your friends will mean more to you and all the jobs you've held, I mean, they will, particularly your family and your closest friends. Do not be blindly loyal to a company. Other CEOs really dispute this with me a lot when they hear that I've said it. In the old days, companies were very loyal to their employees. No more. No more. Some companies are very loyal to their employees. 
but you'll know soon by the way they treat you as you get into them. But if you've given your best, that's all they can ask of you. And, and, and loyalty is important, but blind loyalty is not. Always measure your psychic income. It will mean more than your financial income, and that sounds weird because all of you are saying, look at him, he's up there, you know, he's made a bunch of money and he can say that, but uh, I can assure you that your psychic income is probably the most important. It will mean actually more than your financial income, provided you have enough financial income to have a good life. And we'll talk more about that. But the question is, am I happy? Am I happy? Am I happy in my job? Am I happy in my marriage? Am I happy in my uh, home? Am I happy in my church? Am I happy? And that is not a selfish question. It really means, you know, that I am enjoying what I'm doing. I'm enjoying the person I'm with. I'm enjoying it. And I think it's very important. Now, after 46 years of marriage, I can assure you there were some unhappy days. But I think on balance, the overall, it's been an extraordinary experience for me. Number 23, I really mean it. This is not a joke. Have a dog. Have a dog. A dog will love you unconditionally. A dog will be there for you no matter what. No matter what your wife, your girlfriend, your boyfriend, your partner, your, your life, I mean, your employer, your teacher, your dean, your dog is there. And I promise you from a psychological point of view, being able to go home and tell your dog all about it, your dog is going to agree with you. And uh, for those of you who have dogs, I expect that you understand. I am not a cat person. I could never get my cat to understand, and, uh, and I never did enjoy really cleaning up from the cats. Number 24, make a list of exciting things that you most want to do in your life before you check out. You know, you really don't know at what age you're going to check out. You could be hit by a car. You could develop a serious illness. You could develop many things. You may live a long, happy life, and I hope that each of you lives a very long and a very happy life, and I predict you will. But make a list of exciting things you most want to do now. Write them down, put them in your billfold or your purse. You don't need to show them to anybody else. Such examples, learning to snow ski, learning to fly, climbing a mountain, rafting an exciting river, parachuting, taking a balloon ride, enjoy many of life's inexpensive pleasures, a beautiful sunset with somebody you love, or alone, a quiet walk along a beach, a very cold beer on a hot afternoon, a kiss behind the ear. It helps if it's somebody that you really want to kiss. <laughs> a, a walk in the redwoods, fishing maybe by yourself on a quiet lake in the afternoon catching a five-pound bass. Go at some point, if your life ever permits it, if it ever permits it, to see the Great Wall of China. You say, oh, I can't afford that. Think about booking a trip a year or two ahead on one of these very, very inexpensive packages, or the Taj Mahal, or the pyramids. I mean, set some goals for yourself that you can that you can achieve. I try to ask everybody to go to Washington and sit or visit in the afternoon the Vietnam Memorial Wall. I was involved in raising the funds for that wall because I lost so many of my friends that I'd gone to ROTC with at uh, Lanier High for Boys in Macon or University of Georgia. Um, but sit by that wall or look at it, look at those names. There are 60,000 young American women and men who are on that wall, whose names are on that wall. 
But also think about the fact that more than two million, two million Vietnamese died in that war. And why did they die? Think about the young men and women who are this morning dying trying to establish a democracy in Iraq and who are, as we sit here, engaged in a very brutal battle, particularly with snipers in Afghanistan and the surge that we are launching right now. This next one, you don't have to go too far. In fact, I bet many of you have already been there. But go to a real ghetto around Atlanta. Go to some of the crack houses around some of the crack houses. Go to one of the shelters, the Fuqua shelter or the Zabin shelter. Uh, I say this secretly. I really, I work in the Zabin shelter. Uh, frequently, and I do it very anonymously. In fact, I try to do everything I do anonymously, if it's humanly possible. I think anybody that does good work just to have their name on the wall, name on the building, really has something other than true uh, altruism uh, in, in, involved. But go to a ghetto, go to a slum, a shelter, and see the comparison in the lives of the people there with your own life. It's a fairly uh, it's a fairly uh, clarifying moment for me, and I realize, you know, that I have a responsibility uh, to the less fortunate. Take care of yourself. Really take care of yourself. Nobody else can do that for you. Your mother's not going to do it. Your sister or brother's not going to do it. Your doctor's not going to do it. Uh, Frank took off a great deal of weight because he felt like he needed to get himself in better shape. I need to do the same thing. But take care of yourself. That's not like one third of all cancer deaths, one third are from smoking. I just say that, I'm not trying to be a preacher. Mouth cancer, larynx cancer, throat cancer, lung cancer. And it's just a decision. I also know what an incredible craving that goes, goes with it. Believe in yourself. My mother kept telling me over and over again, Tommy, if you work hard and do right, you can accomplish anything you set out to do. And after she told me that many times, I really came to believe it myself that if I, and I, and I, and I did. 27, within each of you is a set of dreams. You may think about it as you go to bed at night or driving along in the car or maybe after you had the third beer but there's a set of dreams inside each of you. A set of dreams on who you want to be, what you want to become. Is it great wealth? Is it great, terrific job? Is it escape from the conditions in which you find yourself? But the very fact you're here in class is quite good evidence that you are serious about uh, realizing some of your dreams of life. I mean, the fact that I think education is the key that opens so many doors for you. This undergraduate degree, those of you who are getting your MBA, those of you who are getting other degrees here on campus. But don't give up on your dreams. Don't let anybody crush you. Don't let anybody keep you from going for it, whatever it may be. I mentioned earlier about, uh, so I won't repeat it, don't marry the wrong spouse. I also say don't neglect your inner self. And by, by that, I do not mean a religion. It, it may be that it's a religion. But the spiritual side of your life is sort of the inner workings of you you know what's in there, and, and just, just be very sensitive about uh, not neglecting your inner self. Be as generous as you can to others. I don't know if it works for everybody else, but I can't tell you how often when I have been generous to somebody else, not just in a financial way, but how it's come back to me. Ted Turner and I have talked about that a lot because you know, at one point Ted had a bankrupt billboard company, and at one point he had two billion dollars of debt as he was trying to do it. But Ted made the point that uh, virtually every time that he was helpful to others, 
for whatever reason, you know, for whatever reason, it seemed to come back. And I think it's almost been my case. Now, that sounds spiritual, or maybe it sounds hokey, but uh, I've just almost found it a lifetime lesson that when you do for others, you'll get it back, and sometimes back in a much greater magnitude. I always like this poem, and it, uh, it's one that, uh, that, that uh, just very simple. It isn't how you die, it's how you live. It isn't what you take from life, it's what you give, and that in the West essence is but giving back. Do what you love and love what you do. Ruth, Ruth Chris, uh, who owns Ruth Chris Steakhouse, I think came up with that one. It's a very good one. Never make a decision while you're angry, except the decision to cool down, and I've been a failure at that multiple, multiple, multiple times. Uh, I mean, I still have a difficult time when I get angry, not just acting on it, and uh, I work at that a lot. What decision you should make is a decision to cool down before, before making any other decision. Be nice, though it's nice to be important, it's more important to be nice, and then finally, just be thankful for the blessings that you have, especially your family, your friends, uh, and your health. Now, I want you to look at that big note, though, at the bottom, because it's really important. I say many of these lessons are original. Some of them are lifted, borrowed, not plagiarized, but lifted or borrowed from quotes and expressions and notes that I've taken over the past 45 years. And I just say to the original authors, who, authors whose identities I've long ago forgotten, I give full credit, I give full credit and, and, and thanks. That's my summary at uh, the beginning of this, and I would really just sort of conclude by, by saying this. Um, I think in this room are an extraordinary collection of individuals. I mean, each of you is as different as each of the fingerprint on your hand. There is nobody in this room that's exactly like the other person. You're filled with your hopes and your dreams, your frustrations, you're affected by many things in your, envir in your environment over which you don't have control. I mean, so much of what affects you is because of the environment in which you're living and trying to work. But I really also believe that uh, you too can make it, whatever making it means to you. And if I'm not an example, I can give you many, many other examples who, 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 of, of others who can. And I hope that you are as much of a success in your life as you wish to be. And I hope that uh, perhaps these notes might at least in part contribute to, to you heading in that direction. Thank you very much. I take a morning antidepressant. And one of the side effects of it is that uh, I sweat. You'll see that I dab the sweat a lot. So it's not that it's hot in here, but that's, I'd love to take your question on any front, media, politics, government, business. Uh, tell me why you think my list is a lousy list and something on there makes no sense to you, whatever. But let's have at it, please. I applied for a fellowship, and it's something I urge you to look at. It's called the White House Fellowship Program, the White House Fellows. And I applied for it, and after a regional and national screening, I was chosen for it. And that was the way I got to work there. And they put me right beside uh, his key assistant at the time, Bill Moyers, who went on to public television, and that's how I got in the door. Please. Print journalism is perishing. <laughs> How do you think the um, caliber of journalism will change in future years as yeah. a result? I think that with print journalism, magazines and newspapers in this terrible decline, 
that we are losing the watchdogs of our society. We are losing the reporters <clears throat> who cover city hall, cover county government, cover the state capitol. Uh, and, and, and while there are these multiple other sources of news on the internet, uh, I, think it is a, I think it is a very serious uh, development for all of us. Uh, I, I basically say that there are three types of uh, reporters. There are the attack dogs who just love to go out and try to attack institutions and look for Pulitzers. And I've had th those work with me at the Los Angeles Times and CNN. There are the lap dogs who just aren't very serious. They just do a reasonably good job, but they basically go out and cover the news, come back and report it, turn it in. But the watchdogs are really the, 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 the reporters in print and television and others that uh, are, are needed in our society. It's the reason why our free press really matters so much. I am terribly concerned about it. As you know, the internet is, I mean, the, I, I get so much of my information now off of my Blackberry. Uh, I still read the daily paper. I, I still read the paper almost religiously, but I'm getting so much of my information now directly off my desktop and my laptop. I hope that there will be brands coming through to you on your portable devices and in your laptops that will remain very good brands. Brands like the New York Times, brands like uh, the Washington Post, brands like uh, the LA Times, brands like CNN. But uh, if this trend continues where more and more advertising is completely shifting away from newspapers and shifting away to some extent from television, we're really in it for a tough, a, a very different new world, a very different new world. I have two people over here incidentally who worked with me at CNN there. Here's a truth team this morning. Jim and I worked together how many years? Level 11, yeah. And he also served a good bit of time in, the, in, in, our, uh, in our military. What units? I was with the 1st Cavalry Division in Korea in 1951. Other questions? Over here. Other questions? Yes, please. Okay, you mentioned on your deal on the uh, number 24, all the way up to the bottom, it says, uh, go down to a dead or a slime, a shirt in your own town to see the comparison in the life of people there in your life. What do you think about if you almost come to the ghetto and you have dreams and ambitions, sometimes to go to well, it's really tough for me to say some of this because it's really a private side of me, but I, uh, I feel very, very close to the people in the ghetto personally. Uh, I think a lot of it had to do with my uh, growing up. Our son, Wyatt, has run a homeless shelter in downtown uh, Los Angeles, the Pershing Street Hotel in downtown Los Angeles. He has had me into uh, various situations over the years that gave me a perspective, but I have tried my best because I have really been blessed in my life with so much including wealth, including wealth. But, but I feel almost a sense of guilt and shame that those of us who have resources do not do more to help people, lift people up and out of, of the ghettos. Uh, uh, I think we have a responsibility. And I mean, I work for President Johnson who created the Job Corps uh, because he felt that this was one way to help people pull themselves up at, at, through, through tra training programs. I mean. We worked on Head Start to give young people who were coming out of very deprived situation an opportunity to get a Head Start because 
They couldn't function in, in school without some added preparation uh, and, and, and training. But I don't have the answer. I mean, if, if I did, I probably guess I ought to be in, you know, in maybe in politics or something, but I don't have the answer. I think that you know, each one of us can do something about one single person. Uh, I mean, each of us can you know, serve as a big brother or a big sister. Each of us can try to reach out and, 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 and mentor, uh, particularly a young, a young person. But, but I don't know the answer to it. I mean, I know we have, you know, so many programs ranging from food stamps to many others, but uh, it, is a, it is a terrible situation in a country of these resources that can spend the trillions of dollars that we're spending uh, to try to enable people in Iraq and Afghanistan to have a better life when we are putting so little into our own uh, backyards in a way. It's not that I'm opposed to trying to bring about a democracy in Iraq or Afghanistan, but we've got so many desperate, uh, and I look at, you know, the state of Georgia's cutting back on its support of, uh, of homeless programs, cutting back uh, on, I mean, it's, a, it's, a, it's one of the great tragedies of the American experience that we, uh, what would you do? How would you answer your question? Okay, I would answer my own perspective. I, one of my, you know, like some people put pictures of their dream cars, or they put pictures, you know, they put, uh, I ride to nice neighborhoods or million dollar houses every day. Just just to keep my dream alive. Yes. That, that's what I do yeah. for my extra, yeah. <clears throat> my extra time. Yeah. yeah. I always wanted a, uh, I always wanted a, you know, a, a big car, just about for that same reason. But then it became, you know, that big car was not the right car to have. So, I mean, but you know, it's. Uh, <laughs> I wish I knew the answer. I wish I knew the answer. I know this. I will always try to do my part, and I wish that more people who have made it uh, would do their part, too. I think there's a tendency sometimes just to, when you get yourself up and out of it, you basically forget the folks that you left behind. Uh, and it, other questions, please. Okay, I, 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 have a, I have two children, a daughter, Krista, and a son, Wyatt. And after missing maybe a dozen of Krista's soccer matches, um, performances, various things, she was no more than eight, maybe nine years old, and I had missed it, and I was home. And I said, Krista, I, I feel terrible that I had to work late today. She put her a little arm, about nine years old, like this. I'll never forget it. And she said to me, don't forget that you're a daddy too. Don't forget that you're a daddy too. That had such a profound impact on me. And I really started at it. She has not even today, and she's 42, uh, she hasn't fully forgiven, I guess, or released <laughs> the fact that I was an absentee father. I mean, I was out there, uh, and people say, well, that was that era. You know, you were working to make it, working to make it, constantly doing it. I wonder if I, you know, had not tried to get there at six or seven in the morning and had gone home in time to have dinner with them rather than working frequently at 10, 11 o'clock. But I also burned out. Uh, there's several ways you can describe burnout, but it, 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 it was a classic cl clinical depression. I just literally burned out, uh, and I, you can do it. You can press yourself so hard every day that, uh, that you can burn yourself out. Please don't let that happen. That's the flip side of what I'm trying to say. Please, yes.
or maybe make more uh, opportunities available so that family becomes more they really need. Uh, did you all hear that? What can co companies do uh, to try to achieve more balance? I think companies almost have a responsibility to to, uh, to 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 almost order you to take your vacations, to almost order you to go home. Now the overtime rates in so many companies are now so expensive that they don't want you working overtime. But if you're not a uh, if you're not a soured employee uh, in it, but uh, uh, it's so many of the really good companies that, and and. Uh, 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 Bell South is a good example. They have just built in all type of programs throughout their, their, their company, including uh, uh, until recently, you couldn't even get mental health coverage uh, in many of the insurance policies, but most of them are now putting in mental health coverage so that if you have a, you know, you've got insurance for a broken, bo broken arm or broken leg, but you may not have insurance for a broken mind. And uh, depression is one form of, of a broken mind. I see you all are getting antsy. I want to get to, uh, please. Have there ever been times in my career when I really felt nervous? Yes. Many. I feel nervous right now. <laughs> I get nervous before I make any speech. I, I, I get nervous. You, do not, you can't imagine how many hours I put into that list. <laughs> taking them out, putting them in, taking them out, and saying, will these really connect with the people I'm sitting in front of this morning? Maybe not all of them. And I wish, so, I wish you would shred it. If you all see some points in there that you think are just totally BS, I wish you'd tell me and we discuss it. I mean, some people say, what's your spiritual thing? Uh, I am not a regular church attendee, but I have faith. Um, I don't know if there's a God, uh, but I, I know there's some higher power out there, I think. It, I don't know whether the Muslims are right, the Jewish community is right, the Christians are right, I don't know whether the, the Buddhists are right, but everybody, you know, they're, they're, everybody's influenced by their religion. Unfortunately, so much evil is done in the name of religion, the great wars that continue uh, from Israelis and Palestinians right on through us on it, but absolutely I get nervous. And what I do about it? Prepare. I am far better if I'm prepared. Uh, I wrote three different speeches this morning uh, to, to deliver before I decided, well, I'm just going to share my, uh, there's one, and uh, here's another one. But I'm going to share with the students uh, my lessons. And they were lessons that worked for me. And did I frequently ignore them or forget them or violate them? The, the answer is yes. Please. Well, the greatest pressure right now is just economic pressure. There has been a dramatic shift of advertising uh, and readership away from magazine and newspapers over to the new electronics and the internet. That is a massive pressure, and it's on everybody. I don't know how thin you notice the Atlanta paper now Monday and Tuesday, but it's just, I mean, they put the business section in the main news section. One of the greatest pressures, though, is that if you are a really good journalist, you'd like to provide people with as much open information as you could. And if you are a government person, you only want to put out the information that's favorable to you. That is also true of most chief executive officers. That's also true of almost everybody. I bet the leaders of the I bet the leaders of this university only want the good news about this university. And they are not going to really want to provide great cooperation if there's a, I thought about how difficult it must be at the University of Alabama this morning after one of those professors, you know, killed uh, three other professors and perhaps more in it. How open can you be? But it's this constant struggle between the need for openness, which journalists represent, and the control. There's a new expression that's been developed over the last decade or so, spinning, spinning, giving you just what, you want out, and it's a, it's it's a, it's, you, you can get so much garbage uh, if you only take that that's being spun to you. Yes, please. All right, um, don't become a workaholic. All right, uh, in your experience of uh, the success.
successful self-made individuals? How few or how many have you met that didn't have that trait of being a workaholic that were actually able to become financially successful, wealthy, and um, somehow balance the life of being a family man at the same time? All right, well, well, you have to divide it. There are the, what I call the natural born uh, success stories who just by fate are born in as a son, daughter of the owners of the companies. I mean, and I've never really had that much affection for them just because they're being handed it. They're being handed the business. So if you just will put that group o over one side, I just find that most of the successful people I know in almost every area, doesn't matter whether they have a, a degree from Harvard Business School or Clayton State or Georgia State or Valdosta State or Fort Valley State, that their successes are the ones that have worked conscientiously at their work. You, you just are recognized in almost every case as somebody who is an achiever. Uh, and, and in my own experience, and the people I hire, I look to people who have this desire to excel, this desire to do well at what, what they do. Uh, it is not as important what your grade point average is. It's not as important what your, what, what your, whether you were a star quarterback. It's not. And for me, I almost had a bias against hiring the sons and daughters of wealthy people. I know that was wrong uh, because they should be given the opportunities too, but I just almost had a natural bias to go with the person who was trying to pull themselves up uh, on it. And, and when I tell you don't become a workaholic, it is, not, it is not an easy thing if you're going to succeed. I just outworked my competitors. When people looked at this group of who was outworking the other, I outworked them. I wasn't smarter than they were. I wasn't more handsome than they were. I wasn't necessarily same politics. I had no family connections with them, but I outworked them. Now, it's not always the case, but I, I'm going to tell you, in my lifetime, that's what has been the key to, uh, to success. It is a key, though, to have the education. If you don't have your college degree, or, or in these days, almost the need to try to get a master's degree, uh, you can't even get yourself considered uh, uh, frequently, but you are right. On, you're all on the right track with that. Please, three dogs you got up this morning. Three dogs. The um, answer to her question is we should try to fuse in some employment package like they have in the UK, where you get six weeks mm -hmm. holiday. I think that some of those are excessively generous. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, what you want to do now, I'm not, I'm not saying this in a totally non-serious way, but I just love the idea of becoming a professor. Our son now is a, is a teacher, and, uh, you know, he gets three months off. He, he teaches nine uh, months of the year. Now, I'm serious. I, if you just want some time away from just the work, now, I know a lot of research is being done, and I hear great defenses for it, and it's wonderful, though, but I would really think about a career as a professor, as a teacher, as a, uh, or if, if time off means that much, there's a teacher. Uh, <laughs> I know, or, but, but, but wouldn't you say, though, you do have the time, where is the dean? You want me to tell you to cut it off? Sure, sure. But, but wouldn't you recommend, I mean, if, if it's important to have a, a sort of a downtime that you control, that well, teach? In, in some ways, yes, I, I, I agree 100%. I think uh, the faculty members work a lot behind the scenes other than just in the classrooms. However, you're absolutely right. A faculty member can have the option of not working in the summer if they wanted to. Right. And of course, they won't have that income because they don't get paid yeah. for some, but that is an option which uh, a person... I will say this, that this is a very genuine statement. There is no profession that I admire more than that of a teacher. 
you can have more effect on the lives of people as a teacher. And I think I used to put teachers and ministers in that, but I removed ministers almost just because <laughs> I, I am not anti-religion. I, I, all right, how many of you, honestly, now please don't raise your hand if you didn't honestly believe it. How many of you found this valuable to you this morning? Thank you. Have a great day.